Hello, you are watching this video probably because you're a student of analytical chemistry. And specifically, you want to learn something about the Nernst equation. So in this video, we're going to be talking about the Nernst equation in terms of where it comes from. And then we're also going to be seeing how you use the Nernst equation. So the Nernst equation is used to calculate cell potential, the potentials of electrochemical cells under non-standard conditions. But to understand the calculation of cell potential under non-standard conditions, we have to review a little bit about what is meant by standard conditions. And we have learned how to calculate cell potential under standard conditions. You can just look up standard cell potentials for the different reduction and oxidation half reactions. And we know that under standard conditions, the dissolved species will have one mole per liter concentrations. If there's any gases involved in the, in the redox process, those gases have to have one atmosphere pressure. However, you know, we're going to use the Nernst equation to calculate potentials under non-standard conditions. It's very necessary. Very rarely do electrochemical cells actually operate under standard conditions. We need to understand how cell potential depends upon concentrations of species in solution and specifically uh, be able to calculate or quantify cell potential at different concentrations. So the Nernst equation sort of arises from chemical thermodynamics of equilibrium. So if we start with a generalized process where A moles of A react with B moles of B to generate C moles of C plus D moles of D, we know that that system, if it can reach chemical equilibrium, can be described by an equilibrium constant, equilibrium constant which has the form that looks like this we would describe this as equilibrium constant expression. You might remember that it's the law of mass action that basically prescribes the general formula, the general way in which you would set things up to get the equilibrium constant expression. Equilibrium constant expression would be a little more specific. We can use this equilibrium, uh, this mathematical expression to calculate the equilibrium value of the equilibrium constant if we know the concentrations of those species at equilibrium. If the system is at equilibrium and if we know the concentration of the various species, we can plug them into this equation to calculate a value for k. But however, this mathematical expression here, which requires the input of those concentrations, is a general thing that can be calculated or we can use this mathematical equation even if we're not at a chemical equilibrium. If you're not at chemical equilibrium, you can if, if you're at some position in composition of that system and you know the concentrations of those various species, you can plug them, you can still plug them in. But if you're not equilibrium, the the number that you calculate, you shouldn't go calling it K, because if it's not at equilibrium, that will not that calculation will not return value of K. But the value you can call Q. Now let's think about how Q compares to K. As it turns out, you know, you know that uh, chemical, chemical reaction systems are always moving towards equilibrium. If you are at some position, you're not at equilibrium, you, you substitute in those um, concentrations, you come up with the value of Q, and if Q is less than K, well you know that the system is not at equilibrium, but it's striving towards equilibrium. And actually, Q needs, needs to become bigger. You know, the system is going to strive towards equilibrium, so this Q is going to change towards K. So if Q is less than K, Q is going to become bigger and bigger until Q is finally equal to K. And well, how would Q become bigger? Of course, you know, concentrations of the products increase, and simultaneously, the concentrations of the reactants decrease. And you could say that the reaction shifts towards the right. But if Q were greater than K, you'd say, well, it's not equilibrium, and to shift to equilibrium, Q needs to become smaller. And by the same argument, you would say that the reaction shifts towards the left. But if you had some composition of solution, you, if you had all those concentrations, you plugged them in, and the number that you got was actually equal to K, well, then you would say, oh, you are at equilibrium, and the system is not going to change any further. So that's a quick review of the relationship between Q and K. And so now, this equation is from the thermodynamics of, of um, 
the system, relating the composition of the system, which was described by Q, to the driving force. So delta G, the driving force for the reaction, is equal to delta G naught, the driving force for the reaction under standard conditions, plus RT ln Q. So that's always true. Remind ourselves what Q looks like. Okay. And now we're going to play around with this equation. And as we're building up the Nernst equation, it's going to be very useful to take this general equation and see what it kind of looks like or how it changes or see what it becomes under some specific conditions. So the first set of conditions we're going to look at are a set of conditions in which all concentrations are one molar. Sound familiar? It will be like standard conditions. So if all concentrations, concentrations say of C, D, A, and B, were all one molar, well then Q would become 1. Then ln of Q, which is in this term, would be ln of 1, equal to zero. This term would just go away. Under those conditions, then you would just get the statement that the delta G is equal to delta G naught. And then that basically, I think if you look at this properly, this tells you what delta G naught means. Delta G naught is a driving force for the reaction if you're under standard conditions. As advertised, we said we're going to play around with this equation, see what it looks like under a couple of different conditions. So we've explored the first set of conditions. Now let's look at this under some more, a different set of conditions. Let's look at what happens to this equation when you're at equilibrium. Okay, if you're at equilibrium, Q is equal to K. Delta G, the driving force of the reaction, has gone to zero. There's no further driving force for the reaction. There's no driving force for any more chemical changes. So if we make these two substitutions, just basically change Q into K, and for delta G, we're just going to put zero, because under these specific conditions, we're at equilibrium, okay, then this becomes delta G naught is equal to minus RT ln K. So generally, delta G is delta G naught plus RT ln Q. But now let's connect this general chemical thermodynamic equation to the electrochemistry. So anytime there's a delta G, we're going to connect that to the voltage of the cell. So for delta G, we're going to put minus NFE, N is the number of moles of electrons times Faraday's constant. So this is the total amount of charge that moves through that potential. Standard conditions, that would become delta G naught is equal to negative NFE naught. So we can substitute these in for delta G. We're going to put in this. For delta G naught, we're going to put in that. That re equation becomes this. We just made those substitutions. But we can tidy that up. If you walked into this room, you'd say, oh, this is a little bit messy. I can tidy this up a little bit. And to tidy this up, you can divide by negative NF. Divide all these terms through by negative NF. And then that um, tidied up a little bit becomes E is equal to E naught minus RT over NF ln of Q. And that actually, boys and girls, ladies and gentlemen, sports fans, is a version of the Nernst equation. Okay, so this is the Nernst equation that we've got so far. But um, it's not the form that we typically use it with. A typical form has a log term rather than a log ln term. But that's not too hard. There's a conversion there that's easy to make to convert between the ln of a number to the log of the number. Just multiply it. Ln of x is 2.303 log of x. Okay, so now let's tidy this up a little bit further. These are all constants. This is just a number, which is never going to change. Um, R is a gas constant. T is a constant. If we assume that was fixed, we're going to work at 298 degrees Kelvin. That's a constant. And F is a constant as well. We can tidy this up a little bit further by determining the value of this like super constant, which has all these constant in constants inside of it. So we take 2.303 multiply that by the gas constant. The 2.303 is just a number, but the gas constant, 8.314, has units, joules per moles per Kelvin. Temperature, we said we're going to fix at 298 Kelvin, so there's a, the unit there. That's divided by Faraday's constant, 9.6485 times 10 to the fourth coulombs per mole. Okay, moles cancel moles, cool, um, Calvin cancels Calvin, we end up with 0 0.0592 joules per coulomb. But a joule per coulomb is actually 
that's how a volt is defined. Now let's use the Nernst equation in sample calculation that we'll work through together. Okay, we're going to apply the Nernst equation to an electrochemical process that occurs in separate half cells. Here's the overall reaction. And perhaps you might be told that this is the reaction that's going to be split up into electrochemical cell with appropriately with reduction and oxidation and half reactions in the different cells. And you might start with this reaction not balanced. Part of your job is to balance this equation. So you're told these concentrations, these different species that are in the reaction, are not all one mole per liter. And actually there's hydrogen ion concentration specified. Boy, hydrogen ions don't even appear in this unbalanced equation. Okay, but we'll come back to that. We're going to use the Nernst equation. And so we'll just talk about the steps we have to go through. Balance the overall redox reaction. Figure out N. Set up an expression for Q. Then use the concentrations that you've been given in this question to evaluate Q and log Q. Then find the standard cell potential looking things up in tables. So let's balance this equation. Well, we're not going to go through this step by step. This is what we end up with. To balance this, you know, say for example, there's two chromium atoms here, there's got to be two here. And we balance all this. Actually, we had to bring in seven water molecules to balance the oxygens that were on this side. But when we brought in the seven water molecules, we brought in hydrogens, in which we balanced by putting 14 hydrogen ions on this side of the reaction. Okay, so that's balanced with all the stoichiometric coefficients, the, the proper values, and we also understand that as we go from reactants to products, that six electrons must move. And if you're not sure why that would be, review balancing electrochemical reactions. Okay, so set up an expression for Q and then evaluate Q and log Q. Okay, so here's the reaction. Q has this form. So if we plug in those concentrations that were given in this problem into Q, we can calculate a value for the Q. And in this case, Q becomes 5 times 10 to the negative 11. And the log of Q is, is equal to negative 10.30. All right, we need to find E0. So we take these processes, and we can look them up in a table. Of course, when we look in the table, we, we have to see, we have to use them, we have to find them as written as, as reductions. And this is the method for calculating the potential of a cell. Standard cell potential is calculated as the standard cell potential of the cathode minus the standard, standard cell potential of the anode. And that's positive 0 0.825 volts is the standard cell potential. We're not at standard conditions. We need to use a Nernst equation. But now we have everything that we need. Here's a Nernst equation. Well, we've got log, we've got Q and log of Q. Um, we've got E naught. Plug everything in. Um, positive 0 0.85 was E naught. Plug everything in. And from the balance, or from the un, our understanding of the electrochemical reaction, we understand that N is equal to six. Six electrons have to flow as that reaction occurs. And so we get positive 0 0.93 volts. Qualitatively, you can see that if the system, those two half cells, everything was under standard conditions, we would have a, a voltage, cell, cell voltage of positive 0 0.85 volts. But under the conditions that we're at in this question, it becomes positive 0 0.93 volts. The voltage is actually a little bit higher than standard conditions. There we are. Now you understand a little bit about where the Nernst equation comes from, and you, we've walked through a sample application. And so hopefully this is helpful to you in your learning and your use of this uh, Nernst equation to work through your homework problems. So thanks for watching, and thanks for being a good student, doing your work, and uh, learning. See you later.